Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sea View Quantum Network. I'm your presenter, Daniel, and I'm here with producer Claudia Pareco. Our opening song features Sunset Serenade by Cyclone. Albums and singles are available in all music stores and platforms. A Moment of Your Time is one of the most extraordinary gifts we could ever be given. Each week, we create a place for you to rest your heart by providing the platform for peaceable connection to the most gifted light workers, intuitives, alternative healers who will surprise you with something different, something outside of what's expected, innovative and unique. Our shows are held on Fridays at 12 p.m. Eastern U.S. time and 9 a.m. Pacific time. At any moment to participate on our shows, please call 805-830-8344 and press 1 to talk with the host. Take My Call. At any moment before or during the show, you can opt for Take My Call and jump the long line of callers. We are now following the pay-what-you-can business model. You pay what you feel our services are worth to you. You can send a payment using paypal.me slash p-u-r-e-c-o and add the amount that you want. To request a show, please write to Claudia Pareco at cview1111 at gmail.com or visit our website cview1111.net Now, close your eyes and get in touch with the present, the only reality. Feel your body, feel your breath, and let it drift back to the present moment. that many times we are um, 
engage in our life and, and, bec and become just so accustomed of thinking that we can go on, that there's something blocking our lives, that we are not powerful enough to say enough and move on. So I love that you're here, and I would love you to tell us about the topic. How is it that you came up with the, with this um, course? Because we can find it on your website, and we can get um, registered for that. But how is it that you came up with this idea, your journey, your own journey of transformation, Beth? Yes. Well, I believe it's a very inspiring story. At least that's what I've heard from audiences before. So I knew that I had chronic kidney disease and it would be really flaring up and coming to an end stage in my 50s. So I had um, worked at nursing homes and I had worked with clients in physical therapy that had gone through dialysis treatments for the kidney disease. And then most of the time the nursing homes would schedule it. So they would go very early in the morning to their treatments, and then they would come and see the therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, and um, physical therapist after their treatments, and they were exhausted. So that's what I thought kidney disease was going to feel like, that was going to look like. So I told my friends and my family that one at a time, I've had my children, I've had my marriage, I've had my career in physical therapy, and I believed it was my time to go. And I made a big assumption there, big assumption, if you know what assumption means. I'm not going to say it, but if you know what assumption means. And I thought I was going to be just like my clients. So I didn't want to live without quality of life. And I thought with having kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, and being on dialysis, I would have no quality of life. That's what I assumed. So I had traveled the world trying to find other alternatives besides dialysis. And I had not been on dialysis. And I told my friends, you know, and family, I'm not doing this. Well, I got down to 4% kidney function, 4%. And my son came to me. And if you want to believe it's my son, if you want to believe it's God talking through him to me, whatever your belief system is, he said, Mom, you're such a bright, light spirit your two boys, I need you here, Hunter needs you here, and the whole world still needs you here. Please stay on this earth and do dialysis. So, of course, that really, I felt it in my heart. And he had come to me and he asked me this several times to do dialysis. And this was the first time he said it so I could hear it. I was ready at that point to hear it. So being so heartfelt, and it's my son who came to me, I knew I had to change my whole being, going from feeling a victim to this specific life situation, this dis-ease in my body. I like to call it dis-ease rather than disease. It's a dis-ease in my body. It's not balanced. It's not in harmony anymore. It's in dis-ease. And I knew that if I was going to stay here, I couldn't stay in that mindset. So I went through my journey. And as I was going through it, it was, I was journaling on it, journaling on it. And I learned that I came up with a process that worked for me, that I did to become a champion. And changing your mindset, your beliefs, maybe your values and your morals, the whole way of seeing the world and seeing yourself changed with me. And now I have a new kidney in me. I was transplanted last summer. That's giving me more freedom. And even though I have been a champion through all this, today I very feel very much like I'm victorious since I did get that kidney. That is working very well for me. So that's how I came to want to share this information with the audience. You know, Beth, and I remember, I remember, I, that, that is so trans, um, important. And I remember, because I can follow you, and I know that you used to follow me as well. And I remember that uh, moment where you almost say goodbye to 
everything. And I remember yeah. even writing to you that, oh, my God, I'm going to miss you, but if that's what you want, uh, I didn't know how deep it was. And I, it, myself, I am not ready to say goodbye to life. And I, in the moment when you say goodbye and you said, I'm ready, I'm, I'm at ease, I, I was like, oh, I hope that when my time comes, I I do it with such a grace like that. So coming back from saying goodbye, what is the learning steps that that you found through your journey that kept you in this world? Well, first of all, since I had my two children, I felt an obligation to stay. So when I was first staying, I was really doing it for my two boys. And I learned through the process that I wasn't going to stay here with a good mindset and really wanting to be here with both feet planted solidly on this earth if I was just doing it for someone else, even people that I loved. So as I was going through this process, this is what I came up with. First, I had to do activities, meditation, breathing, exploring, peeling the onion is what I call it, for self-awareness. To come to terms with where I was at that point in my life. Because how do you know where you want to go in life? Or how do you make a plan if you don't even know who you are in that moment? So I really had to be brave and dig deep inside me, become courageous, and figure out really who I was. And once I learned who I was from doing more journaling, all these introspective things, then the next step I learned was moving into acceptance of where I was at that point in time. And at that point in time, you know, I was still very close to saying goodbye because I was more afraid of living that I was afraid of dying. And I'm going to say that one more time. At that point when I was saying goodbye, I was more afraid of living than afraid of the process of dying and letting go. So I had to come to terms with that and be in acceptance of where I was at that point in time. So that took some work, introspection again. And then from there... I knew that I had to take different action. The action that I was taking was not going to no longer work for me. So if you take an action that you you have a pattern in your life of how you react to things, how you're proactive to things. If I did the same thing as I always did, I'd still feel like a victim to this disease, this disease, this chronic condition. And at this point, I had been going through the dialysis treatments. One point I had tried it at home, peritoneal dialysis, and that did not work for me. And I had quit, and they had put me on hospice even at that point in time. And then I continued until my son came to me at that 4%. And then by the time I'm talking about moving into action, I was actually in dialysis. And at that point, in acceptance of, yes, this, this is where I'm at, waiting for that kidney transplant. So what I learned from all my experiences, going to workshops, getting coaching, reading books, I call it a step of a a tool of shifting left or stepping left. And for me, kind of like if you have a person on either side of a table and you have a Coke bottle in front of you or a Coke can, if you're sitting on the other side and I'm sitting on this side, your reality of that Coke bottle or that can is going to seem very different. When you express what that reality of that can is, it's going to be very different from my experience over here looking at it. And we could argue, no, that's not reality. This is, this is my reality. And you could go back and forth and argue. So basically, I had to look at this world as that Coke bottle and turning it around. So I had to change my mindset my beliefs about myself and the world, my perceptions, some of my morals that I had. I had to totally have a different experience of this world to want to remain here in harmony and balance 
and having happiness and joy in my life rather than feeling like a victim, rather than that depression, rather than that anxiety. And once I could grasp those concepts and start utilizing those concepts, I really had to trust my gut and trust my instincts. And being in my body to experience what my gut felt like, what my intuition felt like, was very, very powerful. If I would stay outside of my body, remaining numb, remaining in depression or anxiety, it would have been harder for me to experience that gut level of intelligence, that intuition. So I would start with baby steps, things that would seem easier to trust my gut level and my instincts. And then I moved into bigger and bigger events in my life and opportunities in my life. And I finally learned with experience and wisdom that I had my own parachute, that I could jump with not even knowing exactly what was going to happen. It's just I knew that I was supposed to do that or be with that person or say that thing or Whatever that was in that moment, something to get me towards my goals. Maybe I didn't know how I was going to get there, but I was going to jump and then start the process. And from there, I finally learned how I could be a champion in my own life and really embrace being here with that harmony and balance in my life. And I, even going through this whole process, I have been feeling so much happier in my life than I ever felt before this dis-ease put me in this life situation. It's all in our perspective. What I say is I've given up giving up. I'll say that again. I've given up giving up. And I take the perception of it's not a good situation or a bad situation. It is a life experience. And from that life experience, you can gain lessons and knowledge and move forward in your life and have a better life for it. So that's how I came to this topic. Beth, you were telling us about um, that you started to get in touch with your intuition and you started with baby steps on things that you could do that were small and then would become uh, bigger ones. Can you give us an example of one of those little things that you were able to achieve before, because many, many of times our listeners and people that, are, that listen to us, to people that have learned the lesson or have come to a realization, it's in the little big, big um, steps. And those, it's like, how do you do that? How, how do you know uh, when your intuition is talking to you? And can you give us some of those examples that happen in you? Yes. Well, first of all, I use a lot of kinesiology. And if you don't know what that is, you can look it up. But it's basically using that intuition and that gut to know which direction you're supposed to move forward if you lose something, if you're trying to decide what you're going to eat. So let's say you're trying to decide what to eat. You put an orange in one hand and an apple in the other hand, and you place them out in front of you. And it, for me, if I have the apple in my left hand, let's say, I say, should I eat this apple? Is this what my body needs nourishment from? It will become very light, like cotton, and float. And in my right hand, if I have the orange, and I say the same thing, should I eat this orange? Is this going to give me nutrition? And my body, my hand goes down like a rock. For me, through my intuition and using kinesiology, my body is acceptance of that apple in this moment, needing more nutrition from the apple than from the orange. So that's one simple thing. Another simple thing that I can do is if I'm driving and something tells me to turn right here and I think I need to turn left, and usually I go in one direction to the grocery store or to work, but my intuition tells me to go in a different direction. I'll just see what happens and I'll go in that direction. 
And sometimes I don't know the outcome. Was it because there was an accident in the other direction? Or sometimes something interesting will happen when I go in the other the direction that my intuition tells me to go to. And maybe I'll go by a store going, oh, I forgot. I needed to pick up um, some more magazines for my collage. And there, I can go right there and get it. So those are mm-hmm. simple little things that you can do to start really feeling your intuition through meditation, through deep breathing exercises to really get in touch with your body. Now, a bigger thing would be to be to jump into something that you're really not sure. Your body's kind of telling you, yes, it's giving you feedback that, yes, you know, this might be a good thing, but you're not positive that it's going to give you outcome that you want. So for me, it was um, jumping into, yes, I'm going to do dialysis. Yes, I am going to get a kidney transplant. And I never knew how the outcome was going to be with all that, if I was going to be, quote, okay. But with my experience, I learned that I will be okay regardless because I have my own parachute. And once I am in that experience, I will know what to do at that time And if I don't know what to do, I have resources that I can go to, people, books, workshops, things, coaches that can give me that information that I need to continue to move in the direction that I need to. I hope that is clear. Yes, it is. But so many times when we are dealing with a chronic disease, we also have to deal with the people around you. People that yeah. might be negative to you, might not, or people that might be positive to you. How how would how would you manage things like that when you are? In, and we're talking about a chronic disease or something that is impeding mm-hmm. you or doing what you want. When you are encountering people around you, how do you discern and what do you do with people that are negative to you? That's so important because, yes, when you have a disease and people know that you have a disease. Now, this is a a big thing is before I was going to do the dialysis and I was in the process of saying goodbye, there were a lot of people that left me that were like, well, I can't talk to you anymore. I can't deal with this. So they removed themselves from my situation. Now, you could say, you know, that's a bad thing that, you know, some of your friends left, but they left because they couldn't handle the situation. So those weren't the people that I needed to be around at that point in time. They exited because they couldn't handle it. Now, if it's another thing that these people are around and they're giving you negative feedback, um, telling you, you don't look sick, how come you're not doing more for yourself? There are some people in our lives that um, come through our past or um, paths that are not important people in our lives, that people that come through, pass through. Now, if it's those type of people, um, I'll say thank you for your feedback and basically move on. Now, if it's people that are closer to us, let's say friends, families, those type of things, that can be more challenging to hear and to know how to deal with. One big thing that came up with me is my immediate family was saying things that my son should be taking care of me. They should move back to the Carolinas. They should be helping me day to day with some of these things. And they actually called my sons and told them, one of them called my sons and told them to come back to town to take care of their mother. And to me, that was stepping beyond my bounds, that I had worked it out with my children. I felt that that was something that was important for my children and I to deal with, that it wasn't for them to determine what actions I should take. So I don't know if you want to necessarily say they're toxic, but their idea of helping was different than what I felt was different. So what I did is I realized that they were in a place 
that they felt that they could only do so much or were willing to do so much. And because of that, they weren't the people that needed to be around me to support me at that point in time. So what I had decided to do is to love them from a distance and love them for what they could offer me and what love they could give me and not be angry and upset with the things that they couldn't do for me. So that's how I've managed when people are toxic or I feel like I'm not getting the love that I would like to get, that I would like to receive. And, and on the other hand, like how do you how how were you able to choose um, the right healing modality for you? Because there's so many. So how do you discern what works for you and what doesn't? Well, for me, some of it is just from past experience. Um, yoga has always been one of my main tools in life to keep me grounded, to keep me energized, uh, to be able to work with my body and my intuition. Deep breathing exercises, since breath is what we need in life. It's the center of our life. If we're not breathing, we're not here. We've transitioned to wherever we're going to next. So deep breathing exercises. Knowing my body and my intuition would always help me discern what modalities would work and what modalities would not work. And I've learned a lot of the times that I would go to other people to get validation or to get um, help, support from, when I really had those things inside me that I had to go back and dig deep with and remember the tools I've used before, remember the modalities I've used before, And sometimes I forget, like I have a light machine um, from the light center with Carol from the Silver, what is it, Silver Sisters and Carol Calvert. And I forgot that I had the machine right here, so I knew that I could use that. So I have different tools here um, physically and within my own body from using Reiki and I've been a Reiki practitioner. I'm a Reiki master using the Reiki on my own body. So that's how I have discerned what I need for my body. And I think that's different for everyone, how they come to that discernment. Sometimes it's trial and error what's going to work for you until you learn your body, until you learn the process of what you know is of most value to you. Because you can spend so much money and time and energy out there trying to figure out what's going to work for you. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's silver, Sterling Silver Sisters. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, do you want to ring um, Pat from Connecticut to see what her comment about everything that she's heard right now? So, Pat, do you have a question for Beth? Mm-hmm. Pat? Okay. Hi, Pat. Yes. So, she's not responding. She'll bring back with her later. So, um, okay. So let, let's go back to become your own champion on your life. So we're talking about this journey of transformation that regardless of uh, what point in your life you're having, we can all become the champions of, of our lives. And this is a, a journey that where you have created these lessons, these courses that people can and worship that we can find in your website. Can you tell us a little bit more about how is it that we can find them? How can we register? What is it that we are going to find? My website is the best place to go for most of the information. And it's called The Creative Life by design.com and there you'll see most of the information my coaching programs my 
courses that I have on Teachable. Right now I have five courses on Teachable, and I have them in slide form right now, and I'm working on getting them on film, and I'll have that on that Teachable app very soon. I also have other information on the artistry things that I do. I paint and I sell my paintings. And then I love this that I do. From my paintings, I send a photograph into La Gallerie in Montreal, Canada, and they create a line of clothing for me that's called wearable art. And again, through my website, you can connect with La Gallerie and there's a whole line of clothing there that is made from the fabric from my paintings. So that's super fun, super cool. So those are a lot of things that you can find on my website. You can also sign up for my emails to my website. You can put in your email address, and then you'll be getting my newsletter. You can also find me on Facebook, Beth Bador, B-A-D-O-U-R. And I just started a group for people with chronic diseases and illnesses to help them not only survive but thrive with the chronic disease or illness. I just started that the other day. I used to have one that was specifically for chronic kidney patients, and I decided to open it up, so I created a new group on Facebook. On Facebook, you'll also found, find events that I have coming up. And I had forgotten about this one when we were talking earlier, but next Tuesday, I have a free course on Zoom that if you go to Facebook on March the 7th at 7 o'clock or at noon, whichever one you prefer, you can sign up for. It's talking about the topic that we're talking about today, thriving and becoming your own champion through your disease and your illness. So that would be one way that you could connect, and it's free. I do put those free courses out there at some point in time. I also have some paintings that are up at the Neighborhood Cafe, which is a lovely little cafe. They mostly open for breakfast and lunch, and they just started serving dinners, but eight of my paintings are there, and that's in the Huntersville area near Charlotte, North Carolina. So I have a lot of things going on. I'm at a lot of different places. But when I am serving you, I am here specifically for you and your needs. And we live in the present moment at that point in time. And I listen very closely and then give you service, whether it's coaching, whether it's a course, whatever it is at that point in time. So those are the things that I'm doing and where you can find me. Thank you, Beth. And Beth, I know that we've mentioned this before, and most of your work is directed to with, uh, with women that are having any kind of chronic disease. And I, I just wanted to explore a little bit more in this area. Like, we all have our niche, as an area where we get expertise. And of course, your own mm -hmm. life many times ranges to this niche or that. So, if, there, if you are someone that is dealing with a chronic disease and you want the help, why do we need someone like you to help us out? Can you let us know? Yes. Well, my background is in physical therapy. I've been in physical therapy for 30 years plus. And right now I'm no longer able to work in physical therapy due to my kidney disease and another physical issue that I'm having. And that's how I recreated myself. I've been in healthcare. I am not a nurse, I'm not a doctor, but I've been in healthcare. And I can help them through the disease process from that point of view. And then also from going through life coaching courses in order to be able to serve people with chronic disease. I can empathize, sympathize with them because I've had chronic diseases, and I have managed the healthcare system that we're dealing with right now. I use both Western and Eastern medicine alternative sources. However, right now we're living in an environment of Western medicine that is breaking down, that is no longer working for anyone. However, I can help them manage the system the best that I can from my experience on both sides of the issue. 
So that's what I would say to that example, that question. And, and I know that you have some people that are, uh, have come to you and that you have helped them tremendously. Can you share with some of your success stories? Yes. Um, I have had people come to me with deep depression and anxiety, and I have helped them through that so they can have the tools to work through those specific situations in their life. I have dealt with people with chronic diseases, fibromyalgia for one, kidney disease for another, that they have learned to manage the system and to manage their body so they have more energy they're going through their lives with more fluidity, with more grace, with not as much pain. I'm also a Reiki master and a 200-hour certified yoga instructor. So sometimes I can bring those tools into the conversations also, having sometimes one-on-one um, in person. Most of the things I'm doing right now are online, but in person, I can use some more of those modalities, too. And most of those things you can also do online. You know, there's distant Reiki, things like that. So I would tell you those are some examples that I can come up with right off the top of my head. Well, and that is very important because uh, even though in your own story, what you're talking about kidney disease, well, chronic ailment, it's, it could be anything. And so yeah. if you are someone dealing with a chronic disease, I, when you, you are encountered with something that gives you pain or discomfort, and it's day, one, day in, day out, every day, every hour of your life, it gets a toll out of you. And having someone to help you out with and even just listening to you and understanding what you're going through, it's so beneficial for your journey of healing. Oh, yes, so much so. I believe that there's a difference between pain and suffering. There's a huge difference between pain and suffering. And pain is usually something, how I express it is, Let's talk about it as like a baby. When a baby is hungry and pain, needs their diaper changed, they're just going to cry a little bit for mama to, or daddy to come and help them out in that situation. That's how they vocalize what's going on with their bodies at that point in time if they're hungry. And then if they're not paid attention to or if the mom comes along, oh, you know, you'll be okay, you know, I, I'll go get that bottle in a little bit, you know. Then they're going to start, you know, screaming a little bit louder for mama to, or daddy to hear them. You know, you you got to help me out here. You know, I got this whole diaper going on here, and it's very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And then finally, if the baby's going to start screaming. Like, they want attention now. Well, it's the same thing with our body. When our body is experiencing pain, it's giving us signals of what's going on inside our body. And if we don't pay attention to it initially, it will start screaming louder and louder and louder. And then it takes more energy and sometimes more time to calm those things down. And if you can learn to use vagal, your vagus nerve, some tools, that will help to calm your nervous system down. That may help to calm your pain signals going to your brain down so you don't suffer experience as much. And and changing that mentality, it is so important to start the process. And one of the things that you mentioned to the, the, in the in before was that when you usually we have these patterns in the way that we react and we see the world. And when we have a dis ease or a chronic condition or something. The way we have been dealing with a certain um, issue in your life is is not serving you anymore. So you have uh, come up with a system where you can actually find the the way to change that pattern. 
can you explain us a little bit more about how did you come up with a um, strategy to change that? Well, for many, many years now, I believe in the mind, body, spirit quality of our life experiences. If we just deal with the physical, because we're so dimensional, just not the physical level, we're only going to get so far in the process. Then again, if you go into the spiritual realm and all you do is, if you want to say pray about it, um, use the law of manifestation, law of attraction, all those kind of things, again, you're only going to get so far. But if you can bring these things all together, and I believe the, the biggest thing that I learned, the most powerful thing, is it comes down to my energy, my frequency. We are all made of energy and frequency. And if you remain in a very low vibration of feeling a victim, of feeling you're depressed, I'm just not saying sadness, deep depression, deep anxiety, you're in a very low state of vibration or energy. So until you can bring that energy level up, that vibration up, you're still going to have some of the same experiences that you did before. So as you can move up into more of your higher plane, your level of awareness, of awakening, some of those other things, those physical ailments that you're having, won't seem as severe as they used to feel. So it's the mind, body, spirit connection. If your mind is telling you you're still a victim and that's how you're operating, the things that you say to yourself, I'm a victim, poor me, why me, you're going to stay in that low vibration. So starting to change not only your perceptions of things, but how you speak to yourself and how you speak to others about yourself. If you're saying, oh, you know, poor me, I I have to go to dialysis the next day then that's what your body is going to be receiving. But if you say, I'm going to dialysis tomorrow and it's going to cleanse my blood and I'm going to feel so much better and this is a treatment to help support my kidneys, how do you think your body's going to hear that compared to poor me? i got to go to dialysis again. So it's a whole system, a whole structure that's very complex that when someone learns, it really will significantly transform their lives from feeling that victim state to transforming into feeling victorious, even though they still have that dis-ease in their body. Or maybe they don't at that point in time. Maybe from going through this process, they have rid themselves of that disease. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Um, Yes. You are a Reiki healer. You know about energy. When you went for your di- um, for your new kidney, and you, you you felt that new kidney inside of you, how, how did it feel yeah. for you? Did you, were you able to feel that it belonged to someone else's and now it's yours? How did it felt energy energy energy? I I cannot say the word, but in energy terms, how Mm -hmm. did that organ, when it came into you, how does it feel? Does it feel you? Does it feel something from outside that comes inside and then integrates? How does that feel? Well, that's a very interesting question because I believe everybody has a different experience with that. Even before I received this last kidney, because I had a kidney before this that did not work from day one, I felt that that kidney was already inside of me and already was working. So I was using the law of attraction and manifestation that not only was I going to get a kidney this time, it was going to be a good working kidney since last time I did not get that experience. So when I got to the hospital, I felt at ease. I felt relaxed. I felt like, yes, this is a good thing. This is going to work out. And then once I had the kidney in me, 
I was listening and sensing with my body to see if I could tell that it was a different someone else's body part inside of me or was I going to have like a different or what do they call it um, when you crave something different food cravings Mm -hmm. or maybe I would have a different pattern of behavior or maybe I would have a memory of that person and an experience and I was kind of hoping I would experience that and so far I have not I know that it's functioning in me and I feel better but I have not had some of those experiences that other people have told me about or that I've read about that I'm very curious about. So if yeah. there's anybody out there that's listening that has had some of those experiences, I would love to talk to them about that. I'm just fascinated with that. Yeah. yeah that, that was not me. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like um, when I had the COVID vaccine, I I was trying to feel if it felt alien or something because you know all of the things that we're saying and I was like okay let me feel the uh the substance as it goes in and he was like no I cannot feel anything different from from what I am and you know it is mm-hmm. funny because one of the things that I believe and, and I don't know what is your belief is that everything that is essence is uh it's it's the light it's part of the light so anything nothing is Mm -hmm. outside of that so i was thinking maybe the reason why i didn't feel felt like something different from is because we are everything that exists is the same substance so i'm thinking that maybe that's Mm -hmm. the reason why this organ is so just like you because everything is you actually so Mm -hmm. there's not them and us or I right. different. yes yes so, I, so that's yes. why I was yes. yeah and one funny thing about the kidneys is I like to name my kidneys and this kidney I called the game changer because I knew <laughs> that this was going to be a game changer for my life and give me more freedom and I'd have new opportunities that I may not have had if I did not get this transplant so the game changer yeah that's my kidney. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, when if you, you don't a know kidney... my sorry, but if you don't if you don't know my personality, um, I can be very giggly and very playful. <laughs> I understand when I have to be serious, but a big part of me is like a big kid. So I always like to imagine and pretend and play. So that's why I came up with the name for my kidney, the game changer. No, and I think that's that's part of the reason why you're healing so well. So, yes, another um, curiosity that I have is, so you're in kidney failure and you're going to dialysis and you have some experience of yourself and then you get a new kidney. Do you feel different right away or is something that you get different like better and better as days passes or it's just immediately that you feel oh now now my body feels so much better immediately well that's a very good question (laughs) i believe that because we go through the process of the surgery our body also has to heal from the surgical procedure Now, with me, this last time it was a very, well, both times were very big procedures. But this time, they had to cut my my abdomen open from my sternum to my pubic bone to get the original kidney out because I have what's called polycystic kidneys. So if you've ever looked at a lung that is a smoker's lung and how black it is, well, the same thing with the kidney kind of, but it's full of cysts that are dark, um, red blood black all over the kidney so it's enlarged and it's disformed and it was so big in order to put in the new kidney the game changer kidney and have enough room they had to take the other kidney out so my body was going through so much of a healing process from the get-go that to say that I felt an improvement right away no I knew it I knew it intuitively that this was going to work, that I felt better 
energetically, but physically it took me a while to start feeling a lot better. But from the first kidney that I got that did not work from day one, there's a whole story there that I won't get into. I was as sick as a dog that time. Oh, my God, I was so sick. I, I can't even express how sick I felt and how long it took me to come back to some sort of normal lifestyle again. This one, it was so much easier. The process was so much smoother. I was up and moving around and out in the hallway, walking around so much quicker than the first time around. They told me that the creatine level was very good from day one. It was under 1%, which is is just marvelous because it was a 30-year-old kidney. And I was how old? Uh, 58 at the time. Yes, 58 at the time. So, yeah. And like, like you know, if your if the game changer is belong, it used to belong to a male or a female, or you don't know that. Um, I believe that it came from a male, and from what they told me, I believe that it was somebody that may have had a overdose, a drug overdose. Yeah. So I had to sit with that too because I believe that. Part of that energy was still there, and I still do healing energy around that kidney, even though it's functioning very well from that low vibration that I assume was in that person that gave me the kidney. Um, I still work on that to make sure that it doesn't overwhelm my system. And, you know, thank you for, I was tuning in into your uh, kidney, and I felt male as well, male energy. I, mm-hmm. I wonder mm-hmm. if male energy, that's because you made him, well, that's the reason that the um, game changer, what was the name that you put on the kidney, game changer? Yep, the game changer. Mm-hmm. You know, that sounds so male as well, like yeah. so energetically male, uh, achiever, gay. Uh, mm-hmm. And the previous one, did you have a sense that it belonged to a male or a female? Um, I knew it was a male. I knew it was somebody who had had a stroke that um, had a um, history of alcoholism, a history of um, drugs. And I, when I say drugs, I don't know if it was marijuana. I don't know if it was cocaine. I don't know drugs. Um, so for me, again, I felt that it was very low vibration and I called it Big Al. For some reason, <laughs> I was in, yeah, big, it's the Big Al. Um, mm-hmm. I was in getting an ultrasound and the diagnostician that was doing it said to me, so have you called your kidney anything yet? And I was like, no. And Al came to me. I don't know why Al came to me, the name Al. And then he said, well, he knew this person who was on a radio show that was called Big Al. And all of a sudden I was like, yes, that's it. He's Big Al. So that's what I named the first one. And again, it came from a male. This time I was going to call it Betty Boop because I'm so playful. But something said, no, it's not Betty Boop. It's the game changer. And maybe you're right because it was that male energy. Yeah, and, and it sounds right, the game changer. And it's the one yeah. So, Beth, we are getting to the end of today's interview. And what is it that you want people to know? What what message do you want us thinking about? And, not, and what would be the lesson that you want people to remember from all of this? We are more powerful than we give ourselves credit for most of the time. So step into feeling like you are the champion of your life. Embrace it. How do you walk into a room? What do you wear? What do you say to the public? What do you say to yourself? Bring that persona into your being and then go and be it. You can start out authentically being it. And then you can put it out there or you can go out there and start bringing these simple little things in and working on them. And then from going through some of the tools that I've, and exercises that I've been talking about, you can move from that victim mentality in your life to anything, a divorce, um, losing your job, a disease, into